Hello and welcome to the Keeping Podcast with Mario Girard. I plan on doing a series of interviews with fellow TPMs and PMs who are thought leaders and invite them to share their ideas with the TPM community. So if you're interested in sharing your ideas, do reach out to me. Today I have with me a very special guest, Alessandro Catrosini, and we're going to chat about a couple of things, primarily revolving around the fundamental characteristics of TPMs, how we level TPMs, and what the TPM journey sort of looks like. Alessandro has over 20 years of experience. He spent nearly 15 years at Microsoft doing various roles from being a software architect to a group principal program manager. Uh, he then worked at Amazon, and now he's at Oracle's cloud infrastructure team, where he and I are colleagues. He's one of those people I see who take and solve large-scale problems. And another very interesting tidbit about Alessandro is he's done over 200 interviews in the last two years at OCI. Alessandro, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, everyone, and uh, thank you, Mario, for the introduction. Uh, it's kind of a large-scale problems. Yeah, well, more than large-scale problems, I've solved a lot of problems of every size, some of which happen to be larger than others, but I mean, it's kind of a... Yeah, I was going to slack you today, and that's when I saw your tagline, I solved problems or something to that context, right? Yeah, that came out of a joke, actually, because uh, when I was working with a networking team, uh, they started calling behind my back Mr. Wolf, you know, like Winston Wolf of Pulp Fiction. <laughs> Cool. So uh, you've also done a lot of interviews for us. I did, yes. Approximately over the last two years, uh, what do you think the count is? Actually, I was looking at the, the scoreboard. There is a kill board of oh. interviews, which is actually funny. Yeah. I was at uh, 263, I think, since January 2017. Wow, that's that's a lot of interviews. And, and you do them for TPMs, uh, PMs, no. and devs? Uh, yes, pretty much Across anything. The board. Uh, the board. I have done uh, engineers, uh, PMs, uh, TPMs, uh, even admins, uh, solution architects. Some have been really interesting stories. Uh, so guys that came for one job and got something completely different. Uh, so it's kind of... Let's start with like you from your perspective. How do you define the TPM rule? You know, there's a story that I remember hearing at uh, a symposium of PMs at Microsoft probably pff, kind of decade plus ago, damn that old, yes. And uh, that kind of stuck with me because it captures the essence. If you think of uh, a team like a big cake, you can start slicing it. And you could slice a very clean uh, slice uh, that would be engineering, a very clean slice uh, that would be product management, a very clean slice that is QA. When you're done cutting slices, all the crumbles that remain on the plate that we're keeping it all together, those are the TPMs. I was going to think that you were going to see the icing on the cake, <laughs> which kind of spreads across. That's what we also do look at it. But that right? is probably the more noble way to define <laughs> it. But yeah. Yes. My view is that effective TPMs are the connective tissue. What keeps it all together, what really gives structure to, to things, gives shape. How do you see this role? You, since you've interviewed a lot of people across different organizations and you work at Microsoft for a very long time, how do you see this role differently in different organizations? Do they, do they differ across organizations? Let me answer with another metaphor. They differ in race, not in species. So the appearance may look different, but the essence is the same. And what is the essence? The essence is all about communication, getting things done, focusing on uh, uh, getting people to collaborate, uh, focusing on streamlining processes, focusing on uh, making sure that the machinery that is executing something runs unimpeded and at that maximum efficiency. Yeah, I think uh, I was once given an opportunity where I had to come in and build out a new team. And after like eight months to one year, I, I remember telling my at my one on one telling my manager, now it's a well oiled machine. It will hum and it does what it needs to do on its own with a little lesser effort than originally we were when we were putting all the pieces together, there are a lot of there's a lot of noise, there's no lubrication, there's a lot of chaos. And especially if you're an embedded TPM within a team, but that team has a lot of dependencies, then you 
have a lot of issues that you're trying to deal with. There are a multitude of problems that you might have. Again, using yet another metaphor just to confuse things a little bit more, uh, I like to think of TPMs as the catalysts of the reactions. So you not necessarily participate in the reaction, but the reaction doesn't happen without you. So very, you, have, you do have a lot of metaphors. So that's a very interesting way to think about it. You start, you, you are the beginner and you give direction and you push your team to go in a certain direction. You are the initiator, the facilitator, and the closer. See, that's a good way to look at it. Initiator, facilitator, and the closer. So you do provide the direction, you make sure that they get to the point they need to get to, but they might do a lot of the work on their own. Yes. And you're just guiding them like a, like a... You're providing the framework for this to happen. Uh, yeah, that's a very good way. Uh, and, and can you give an example of something like that, like a framework? Could be like a scrum process or, or a... Really? Anything. Typically, a framework uh, comes uh, uh, in the form of a culture, a process, uh, an organization, uh, a tool, and it really depends on uh, what you're trying to do. Yeah. It, it is very kind of a, uh, I realize that I'm giving you a beautiful non-answer here. <laughs> no, I, I think, I, I, let's look at it from another perspective, right? We are talking about what is the role of a TPM, but why, if you think about it the other way, why does an organization need a TPM in the first place, right? It's like uh, uh, an organization doesn't need a TPM initially. You get to a point uh, where the, the level of interaction between the parts uh, needs to be grown organically and not inorganically, so you need order. If you think about it, it's like growing hair. If you have short hair, you can afford not brushing it, yeah. but if you don't brush hair, when it gets longer, it gets tangled. And that's, that's why TPMs are needed. Basically, TPMs uh, apply order in the uh, communication yes. across parts of the organization. They create uh, a warm holes uh, between parts of the organization that wouldn't talk necessarily. They provide sharing of information. They provide uh, uh, standardization of the processes. They provide multiplication of the effectiveness because uh, they multiply the opportunity to collaborate. I think, I think that kind of fits into what we were originally talking about of you being, you, you call yourself as a problem solver, right? And that in itself is a very unique skill because I, I've seen you solve like very large scale problems, which are a combination of uh, organizational culture, maybe. It might be a combination of technical things that need to be sorted out, it might be process. And it's actually a, co it's a combombination of the whole thing, right? I said, uh, I had a blessing in my life of uh, working on a lot of different domains. Yeah. So I kind of had the, the, the lack of being exposed to a lot of different ways of doing things, which is why they kind of threw me in this role of uh, uh, this is a big ball of uh, chaos uh, that we don't know how to get out of, go figure it out. And, and uh, since I joined uh, Oracle here, that's pretty much the type of role that I have been playing. What are the main success metrics that you use to define the result? Is it simple normally or is it a very complex metric or is it like, hey, get this done? Again, like everything in uh, program management, the answer is it depends. Yeah. <laughs> and it also depends who you ask uh, and uh, depends uh, what success looks like. Usually rather than metrics, uh, I like having an exit criteria. So how do I know that I'm done? Black and white. No what, what does done look like? And yeah. done sometimes uh, could be simply a, a good enough in a scale. Yeah or just a black or white, or a, for example, when uh, I had set up, um, set as a goal to uh, jumpstart the uh, DCIM for our infrastructure. I mean, when I started, uh, we were doing the management of our data centers uh, with a whole bunch of Excel spreadsheets. Well, guess what? Been there, done that, I know that that thing starts collapsing pretty quickly. Yeah. And if you don't fix it when you are small, then it becomes too late. So uh, I kind of, uh, scrapped together uh, a developer and uh, another TPM uh, to kind of start prototyping what uh, an open DCIM solution would look like so that uh, we could uh, cross-reference uh, the asset information of yeah. what was going into the data centers uh, with the defect tickets, uh, with the recalls, uh, with the yeah. versions of the firmware, with all the details uh, uh, that you can imagine. We ended up with a tool now that can graphically extract by navigating from a hierarchical map that goes from the world 
to the single server within a rack, within a hall, within a row, within a data center, within a region. Uh, can tell you everything about that machine, including what is running on it, what version of the software, who is using it, has it made money last month, uh, everything. Cool. Including what are the part numbers of the things inside, uh, what have we ever changed in the lifetime of this machine, uh, wow. what is the likelihood of component X failing in the next Y days, and uh, all that. Uh, and for people who don't know a lot about this, I'd like you to tell them, like, What's the impact uh, in a very high le level? Let me give you a practical example of uh, the crowning achievement of this tool. Do you remember a few months ago, not... Uh, um, Spectre? No, it wasn't Spectre. It was the, the second one, the L1TP, I think, yeah. bug that came out yes. uh, from Intel. Yeah. So it was a big scramble. We had to identify uh, which machines uh, were affected and patch them. It took us 24 hours. And, and, and for the and, whole fleet of the whole Oracle Cloud. Yeah, and and for somebody else who, for company X or company Y who had that, who had their own data center for, managing it. Un, unnamed the divisions uh, within other larger companies uh, that may be close to ours, uh, they're not done yet. Yeah. And it was September when they started. Yeah. Okay. Even more importantly, they don't know if they're done. Yeah. Because the problem is an issue of detection, not an issue of fix. That's that's interesting. The reason I was bringing this up and I was asking this question is you also authored the leveling guide for OCI, for our yes. power infrastructure team. And, and one of the primary things you mentioned on the leveling guide was scope and impact. Yes. Right? And that's why I was talking about the scope and, and the impact. But and they're not the same thing. They're not the same thing. They're totally different. But you spoke to the scope. And there was a little bit of the impact. Can you tell me more about how you see that? Uh, usually how I define it is that uh, scope is the mm, direct blasting cone of the people that you're working with and that they're directly affected by the change that you're introducing. Impact uh, is uh, the direct effect uh, of the change that you have introduced. So let me make an example. The scope of the work of starting DCIM was a very small team of developers that had to work on that and not something else. The impact... Uh, has been company-wide. Do you, do you put one over the other? Like if you, if you have Usually, track, let's if, put it this way. Sco scope uh, is, uh, is something that is easy to gauge. Impact is something that you can hope. Uh, OK. That you can design for and yeah, uh, yeah. partially it's, control. It's, it's but very I mean, hard to, yeah. One is an input variable, was it an output variable? Yeah, and you don't know the output variable, how big or how small it is. It's hard. You don't know to how nonlinear the system is. Yeah, yeah, that's as as simple as that. So let's move to a, to an, to another topic uh, of uh, interviewing because you've done so much. You've interviewed so many candidates. What do you look for in a TPM? If you can give five things that you you expect, you're you're looking for in, at an interview. That's a good question, actually. I think that. Uh, it is also something that depends a lot on the person that you have in front of you and mm -hmm. the flavor of a TPM that you're looking for. Of course, you look for the fundamentals. And what, so what are the fundamentals? That, the fundamentals... Uh, Communication. You need a good communicator. and Articulation. Yeah, I'm looking for a, a specific type of articulation. Uh, I really like, and again, it's not that you must have it, but it, in my experience, it correlates with success uh, in program management uh, to really interiorize the ability to answer in a spiral. If I'm asking you a very complex question that can be distilled to a yes or a no, the first words out of your mouth ought to be yes or no. Then you can give me level of explanations that go to the moon and back, but answer, answer the question in the first five seconds so that you will always gather the attention of the right people, the ones that give you 30 seconds of their attention. We have in our management chain people that we can both imagine. Yes. Where if you don't answer the question in the first 30 minutes, they flip the bit on you. Not 30 minutes, like 30 uh, seconds. 30 seconds, right? It's like, um, I, I think, I think I, I know the meetings you're talking about where there's somebody asking you a very specific, very complex question, which you can probably write a three pager on. Please, I mean, right? and sometimes the question is as easy as, uh, are you on track for shipping this one on there? And you can start, well, if this happens, if this happens, if 23 items happen, so then that guy delivers this. At, at the end of the story, the, <laughs> what management has to hear is yes or no. Yes. Do you need my help or you do not need my help? Yeah. It's kind of, it's black or white. Yeah. Either the cat is alive or the cat is dead. Sorry, no quantum here. <laughs> That's a very interesting thing, right? 
Okay, so so we're coming back to the original question. Communication. Communication. Is... Poise under fire. Yeah. Kind of, uh, and either you tell me a story of uh, sometimes uh, when you had to go to hell and back, or I'm going to manufacture one where I'm sending you to hell and see how you get back. <laughs> yes, I also think on the same thing. I I tell, I or I ask people whether they sometimes have a thick skin, right? Yes. Because there are going to be situations where. There's chaos, little chaos. Especially with very senior candidates. Uh, I love the interviews uh, where I basically ask them to show me your shield and how did you get this bump? How did you get this scratch? Yeah. And what did you learn from it? And was it fun? And what were you, what were you guys doing? Yeah. And did you have fun along the way or were you able to sustain and withstand? I don't know. At the end of the story, it's, it's amazing how in the technology world, pretty much it's pretty easy to uh, characterize people into two enormous categories of the builders and the administrators. Yeah. Builders extract their pleasure by creating something new where there is nothing, by taking an idea and distilling it into something. Yeah. The problem is that they get bored if you tell them to maintain something that has been already built. The administrators are exactly the opposite. Uh, need a world where the rules are already defined, defined more or less well, yes. and they're going to maintain it and run it uh, like a beautiful Swiss clock. Yeah. And you need both uh, at different, different generations stages. at the different stages of the process. Yeah, there are different stages of even the product. If you think yes. about a product or a service, uh, launching a brand new service is one thing versus maintaining an existing service. Let's put it this way. You don't want a builder in operations. Yeah, exactly, right? Or at least you want very few in very controlled spots. Yeah. And, and that's, we are digressing, but when I was looking for a job, uh, when I moved to OCI, one of the things I was looking for is, where is somebody doing something ground up from scratch? And I wanted to be in the cloud. Uh, and this was the right place for me, right? I told you the story, how I came here. Right? It's yeah. kind of, I heard socially that Oracle was building a team uh, that was building a cloud from scratch. And I kind of hustled and I could find a phone number of the director of recruiting <laughs> here that I called to call and say, hey, uh, I heard that you guys are building a cloud. How do I get in? Yeah. <laughs> kind of. yeah. And it's interesting, right? You come in, you find your way after that. You, we all have moved teams or we figure out where we want to fit in. I usually uh, explain this uh, with the movement of tectonic plaques. I mean, when a, when a continent expands, uh, yeah. uh, I mean, you definitely can't stay where you are. Yeah. You either follow one of the moving parts uh, or you grow to control all three or you jump onto another. Uh, so yeah, If you stand back, still, you sink. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Coming back to our original question, what are the fundamental characters? I think we said uh, one was communication, two was... Uh, Boys under fire. Boys three. Three is thinking outside of the box. That's a little ambiguous. And uh, this is the... Uh, uh, usually I like the people that can show me that they can get out of a Kobayashi Maru. So that if uh, the rules of the game are stacked in such a way that uh, they, uh, they have game. already lost, change the freaking rules. Or play a different game. That's, I've never thought about that. I've never I mean, thought the situations it. where, uh, oh, yeah. You push into a corner and there's no way out. You have to sink. Or you cut a hole and you go to the room next door. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's a very interesting, uh, okay. And, and that's more for very experienced people. Well, not necessarily, because, I mean, the, usually these are instincts uh, that are kind of, a, you don't learn this type of thing. You have to be pushed into it. Or you're into it. So what happens if I give you a situation like that? Or when you have been in a situation like that, what have you done? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Three. Any other uh, things you can think about? And then, of course, there are, as you grow, uh, I think that communication is a very wide range. I care a lot about negotiators. And a negotiator is basically an, an intrinsic tradesman. That, okay, I need that thing that you have. What do I have that I can trade for it? And it doesn't matter if I think it's worthless because you are the one that has to think it's not. When you find people that have this mindset, uh, usually they're going to be phenomenal to be at. Negotiation. That is a very interesting skill because uh, you call yourself a problem solver and one of the key points of a problem solver is to negotiate when somebody doesn't want to give up something. And sometimes you negotiate a problem away. Or you negotiate the problem away. It's again, that comes back to the outside the box. So it, it kind of fits in together as a puzzle uh, of all these. Uh, do, you, do you think any other, uh, any other common traits? Curiosity. Curiosity. 
they always tell it as a joke, the joke of the uh, shoe company that wants to expand their business to Africa and send their two salespeople. And after one month, they both send a telegram. Uh, one says, uh, uh, why did you even send me here? Nobody's uh, wearing shoes. Coming back tomorrow, huge waste of time, stop. The other one sends uh, a telegram saying, phenomenal opportunity. Nobody's wearing shoes. Please send me an entire sampling and uh, I need to stay here more. Which one is a better TPM? Perspective, right? How you think How you think a problem is... Whether you look at only the negative side, I've actually seen that in, in when I worked in other places where you can see TPMs who just focus on the negatives. How do you how do you bring up a problem? Do you say the negatives of the problem or what the problem is going to be, or do you say how how do you phrase that even? You know, sometimes. Oh, the best way to frame a problem to explain what the world would be if it was not there. Yeah. yeah that's Describe that. how the world would be had this not be around. Yeah. Then everybody will focus on how to remove it. Any other qualities you think? Well, then, then we, we start to go into the uh, more specialistic ones uh, where you need, of course, to be organized, uh, to be good at multitasking. Emotional to, intelligence. Emotional intelligence usually uh, is almost inevitable if you're a good yeah. negotiator. Probably should have mentioned that uh, upstream of that. Uh, cool. Executive presence sometimes. Yeah. Because, I mean, uh, honestly... Especially in organizations like ours, uh, uh, a large number of TPMs and end up being XOs uh, of some leader of some yeah. type. Sometimes it's important to be able to tell them, hey, you are wrong and this is why, even when the, the, they're about to go full steam down. Yeah. And then also be open to hear a rebuttal and understand why not. So we, we, we went through a, a good list of characteristics or what, what a TPM needs. How do you evaluate like how proficient one is in that particular area. Do you have like any tips or pointers? Like, or is it just experience, comes down to experience? Sometimes, uh, well, communication, you evaluate yes. it uh, just directly. I mean, how clear are they? How do they react to interruptions? Uh, read their nonverbal cues? Uh, do they get impatient? Uh, yeah. Do they get flustered? Poison under fire, same thing. Yeah. I mean, if you start throwing interruptions and throwing it away or taking their uh, momentum, the most uh, uh, prized project and starting poking holes in it, how do they uh, react? Yeah. Uh, Let's talk a little bit. So, on that, do you have any red flags? Right? Ego. Ego. Ego is a big red flag. Especially at OCI, I know that. No, no, it's kind of an ego. Ego is, is, a, general, ego is a, the number one enemy of a TPM because a, a TPM is a we entity. At the end of the story, what you have done, uh, uh, you wouldn't have been able to do in isolation anyway. Yeah. But you have been, a, uh, basically, you are an operator, you need an operand. Yeah. So how do you respect your operands? And sometimes they might be difficult to work with. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter, right? Maybe you are difficult to work with. <laughs> yes. So that's the, uh, especially in an interview setting, that, that's usually a red flag. Yeah. What oh, are I had to flags? leave because the guy was terrible. So, oh, really? That's kind of, you're telling me that when there is a problem, you flee and that you can't work with hard people. Black, red, red. <laughs> what are the other red? Ego, I think, is definitely I think the number one of the number one things. What are the other red flags? Negative. Fear of the dark. So if there is something unknown and you, di you don't dive head first, uh, you're showing strong uh, uh, traits of uh, administrator, which, again, in our culture right now is not a uh, primary trait for a TPM. I'm very, that's a, I've never thought about it that way. So you give somebody a problem and, and they don't know the solution to it, but somebody who goes in headfirst and tries to oh, solve the you problem. You give them a problem in something that they have never absolutely worked. no clue about and that they definitely can't. How do they react? And it's not a matter of do they solve the problem, it's how yes. do they react? react. So you're, you're judging the reaction there. Well, they're willing the to person that becomes people. defensive and says, oh, I don't know anything about this. I'm sorry, I can't do this. Well, what if you didn't have a choice? What if you, if you didn't do this, you die? What do you do? <laughs> That's, yeah, two great, two great ones. Any other red flags? The person who is always right. Or who thinks he's always right. Yeah, that is, uh, 
Especially yeah. in a team setting, right? I, that's, that's I, I remember that uh, I was snickered when uh, at Amazon I was reading the leadership principle that uh, I, I, I write a lot. I write a lot. Because uh, it's it's basically um, a, a gigantic balloon inflation for egos. Because uh, if I'm assuming that I'm right a lot, I'm, I'm right a lot, uh, then uh, I'm not going to question my being right. You should always be the first one uh, that puts in questions. Okay, let's suppose for a second that I were wrong. What would happen? Okay, then what you are saying doesn't make sense because. Uh, it is disproved by this point and this point and this point. But hey, wait a minute. What about this one? Actually, yeah, yeah, you have a point here. So how do I reconcile that? So willing to admit, yeah. I think it's not just willing to admit. It's really leading with what if. And yeah, I think being humble to a certain degree, I think that came with the ego thing, right? Remember, if you're the facilitator, yeah, you need to ease things in. You never can take a rigid approach. Any other red flags? Well, the, the obvious ones, uh, kind of. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, the the the, uh, the person that comes through as an obvious jerk. <laughs> yes. Um, the, um, the situations where it's uh, the obvious red flags uh, is the person that simply tries to portray themselves as what they are not. And that comes across very fast. Right? Oh, yeah. for, for people like you who've done like hundreds of interviews, you can in the first five minutes you probably know. No, I mean, I've, <laughs> I mean, some uh, were epic. I remember what was it and. That's probably 10 years ago, the, this college hire that came from a super renowned school uh, on the East Coast uh, in, uh, in Massachusetts that starts with age. <laughs> and uh, he had this resume that was absolutely incredible. I mean, this kid was just fresh out of college, had already written compilers, was fluent in three languages, was awesome. His misfortune was that in his loop, there were, uh, he was supposed to be fluent in French, English, and German, and he ended up in the loop with a French, an English, and an Italian. Sorry, in Italian, French, and German, and he ended up on a loop with an Italian, a French, and a German. <laughs> Let's say it didn't go well. <laughs> Interesting. That's interesting. Uh, you know that the loop is not, uh, is not going well when you're starting the conversation with, okay, what else on, in this resume is not true? <laughs> uh... Let's look at the other side of the uh, of the picture. What perks your interest? Like you re- literally sit up and you're, you're it makes you like listen to a candidate. Oh come on! It's kind of a first of all, there are people that have a, a type of experience that are just fascinating. Fascinating. And honestly, I love interviewing because of the the, the section of humanity that, that comes uh, presents in. you from. Yeah, yeah. I've interviewed in anything from former officers of nuclear submarines uh, to directors of the FBI to <laughs> people that were doing underwater welding to people who wrote large-scale trading systems for hedge funds. Yeah, so yeah. Every one of these people has absolutely fascinating stories to tell. And usually the, the best way to create a report is to share really a sincere interest for what these people have done. Yeah. One, and really make an effort to really understand not just what is that they did and uh, what, what their role was, but why it was important, or why it was exciting, why, it, why could it have been important for them and that type of... Uh, yeah, that's a interesting thing. I mean, if you think about it, what you're doing with an interview is trying to get uh, uh, the x-rays at the soul of this person. Yeah. So the sooner you get to the soul, the better it is. And you don't yeah. get to the soul by asking them why uh, the manhole covers around. Exactly. Uh, when, you're, when you're talking about looking at the soul, I just recollected one of the recent interviews I had. It probably will stick with me for a long time because this kind of came in. I gave, him a, I gave him a problem to solve. He didn't know what the problem was. He didn't have any exposure to that space. But how excited he was to jump in and solve, it made me excited where I was like, okay, I'm going to help you do this. I'm going to walk with you. So there's one thing that I forgot saying that is also a way that I always explain what a good TPM is. A good TPM doesn't paint a fence, builds Tom Sawyer's fence and throws a paint, uh, fence painting party. Yeah. And everybody flocks to it because it's cool. Yeah. So... Yeah, 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 that's absolutely true. If you can inspire people to do uh, what you need done, then yeah. you're already halfway there. Yeah, and some people I think are very neat that comes from within the soul, like within the fabric of the human being. That guy was just 
excited. I think there's, there's also probably a little bit more that he had his fundamentals really strong because of which he was able to solve the problem really well. But he was super excited and he was having fun because he was like, he'll, he'll, he'll say something, he'll, he'll do something and then we okay, because of this, these four things are going to be impacted and this these are the problems which will happen if I do this and I'm going to solve this like this, I can do this by this or this is the impact of that. So, when you're finding somebody that has a, a systemic reasoning like that and... Uh, it's just like, I was super excited. I think that was... Think about it. Uh, you can approach problem solving uh, through systems or through tasks. Yeah. If, you, if you approach it through tasks, uh, everything's a snowflake. And a mistake means uh, go back and redo it. If you approach it through a system, it is going to be a progressive growth uh, where eventually the problem will just melt away. Hi, folks. I hope you enjoyed that. I had to split the interview into two parts. Simply play the next episode to hear the rest of the interview with Alessandro. And if you're interested in learning more about TPMs and what TPMs do, do feel free to check out my website, www.mariogirard.com. Thank you.